So in addition to Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, um, there were other major social thinkers uh, who, in the history of, of sociology in terms of its teaching, have not gotten as much attention, but from my perspective, are very important for us to know about. And two of them I'm going to talk about today. Um, one is W.E.B. Du Bois, and the other is Jane Addams. And I'll start with um, Du Bois. Um, du Bois was an African-American scholar who um, was one of the, um, I believe, the first, actually, um, African-American man to get, receive a PhD from Harvard University. Um, back at um, the, uh, he was a student at the end of the 19th and very beginning of the 20th century and was a major player in intellectual life of America as well as its political life. Um, and Du Bois was a sociologist. Um, so he uh, uh, trained as a sociologist and um, uh, really attempted to transform the study of American sociology um, and sociology more generally. And one of his critical interventions was to argue that it would be impossible to understand society, in particular American society, but society more generally without a conceptualization of race. Um, and I'm going to talk about two contributions of Du Bois's. Um, uh, the first will be in an early book that he wrote called Philadelphia Negro, and then the second um, will be a second book that he wrote called Black Reconstruction, which is about um, uh, the experience of Reconstruction and, um, in particular, an analysis of slavery in the South, and then the consequent attempts um, to create a society in the South after slavery, after the end of the Civil War, um, uh, and its uh, uh, failure. So uh, Du Bois was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and um, uh, educated initially uh, in um, uh, what we refer to as now historically black colleges and universities. Um, and ended up at Harvard, where he studied sociology. But due to um, uh, racism in the sociological profession um, and in the academy more generally, um, was unable to secure a position at a white college and university, a historically white college and university, and spent much of his early career moving around from institution to institution, um, uh, but doing a range of really kind of pioneering studies. And so the first I wanted to talk about was the Philadelphia Negro, which was a study that he did in part as a researcher um, affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania, um, where he was interested in um, uh, a particular ward in Philadelphia that was populated almost exclusively by African Americans. And he was interested in kind of coming to make sense of what was happening in this neighborhood, um, and how it was that those happenings in the neighborhood helped explain um, uh, some of uh, the sort of dominated position of black Americans. So you should think about this as like early, early 1900s and Du Bois is tasked with sort of coming to understand this ward, this neighborhood in Philadelphia. And what he does is design what we would consider today a truly modern methodological study. Um, so he ends up doing a survey, a series of interviews, household visits, in order to capture the structure of the neighborhood, that is what the space looks like, the set of people who live in it, the organizational environment of the neighborhood, and he uses this to try and make sense of why it is that there are higher rates of crime in the neighborhood, why it is that um, there are higher rates of out-of-wedlock birth in the neighborhood. And Du Bois, in this work, from my reading, basically does something that's really radical in comparison to what Marx and Weber and Durkheim were doing, which is that he used um, a contemporary set of what we would call today a contemporary set of methodological techniques to understand the individual level of the neighborhood, that is, how it was that individual people were producing the outcomes, a relational level of the neighborhood, so looking at the ways in which people related to one another and their overall um, social structure, looking at the organizational level of the neighborhood, which is to say, looking at the ways in which different institutions within the neighborhood affected people's lives, and then also looking at spatial dynamics. That is, how is it that the physical structure of the neighborhood itself produced a set of interactions and a likely set of dynamics? Um, earlier in the 
earlier lecture, I noted that sociology is in part the study of the ways in which individual behaviors are influenced by other sets of things. Um, and so uh, another way of thinking about this is that action is conditional. Um, and one of the things that Du Bois points out here, um, which is now part of a long sociological tradition, is the ways in which space elicits, elicits behaviors. So thinking about the ways in which people are influenced by context or situation means that lots of things that aren't even sort of other human beings should be part of our socioanalysis. Or um, uh, put differently, it's not just that like you're in a school setting and that setting, because there's a teacher and students with different roles is influencing your behavior. The physical structure of the classroom matters. So, you know, if you think about listening to these lectures right now, um, in, in, for those of you who are listening, um, not in the same moment that I'm speaking, like it's a very different interactive experience. Or just think about a physical classroom for a moment and ask what the difference is between a classroom that has a bunch of rows of seating where every student basically looks at the back of the head of each student versus a classroom that's structured like a circle um, where students see one another. And the insight here is that physical space, the actual physical arrangements of the desks produces interactions. We know this sort of intuitively, but it opens up a whole range of things that we might be interested in the study of a society or in the study of a community, which is to say, how is it that physical objects um, or the physical organization of space influences our day-to-day -day life. And the next time that you sort of walk outside, think about how it is that the organization of physical space, the, what we would refer to as the built environment, influences you. So whether or not there are sidewalks in the places that you're walking has a deep influence on whether or not there's like community life on the street. If there are no sidewalks and you can only just drive, the likelihood that there's an active community life on the street is very low. But if there are sidewalks, the chances that you have street life in some way are higher. In this sense, the physical built environment produces all kinds of interactions. Now, for Du Bois, what this meant was in the study of this neighborhood in Philadelphia, he began to look at, like, there are maps in this book of the organization of the neighborhood where you can begin to see how it is that alleys produce particular kinds of behaviors versus streets and what the large streets are doing in order to bound the neighborhood, to sort of constrain it. Du Bois was also deeply interested in concentrations of poverty. And we will return to this conceptualization when we get to urban sociology and inequality, both of which. But one of the fundamental insights here is that it's different if you're poor whether or not you're poor surrounded by lots of other poor people or you're poor surrounded by not so many other poor people. And this is a really interesting thing to think about because intuitively, again, it makes a lot of sense, but the implications can be fairly profound. That is, the consequences for people who experience poverty are not just the experience of poverty. It's not just that you don't have money. It's in part conditional on what the experience of everyone around you is like. So if everyone around you is also poor, that poverty is going to be stickier or that poverty is really likely to be more consequential for you because it's going to be harder to exit that experience of poverty. The reasons for this are multiple and we'll get to this in other lectures. We'll talk about the ways in which, you know, insofar as you're surrounded by other people who are poor, there are fewer resources in your neighborhood. Resources not just meaning the amount of money, but the knowledge that people have about jobs, the access that they have to information about social services, et cetera, et cetera, those sets of things are less available and it makes poverty stickier or it makes poverty more difficult for people to exit. Again, the insight is the way in which individual level behaviors are deeply influenced by the relationships that people are embedded within. And it shows the ways in which concentrations of particular groups produce some sets of outcomes. So, you know, the opposite of this would be to think about schools and the ways in which, you know, some schools, insofar as their concentrations of wealthy people and people with a lot of resources, might be able to augment 
the wealth and advantage of the people in those schools. So Du Bois is interested then in not just like who makes up the neighborhood, but he was interested in the individual level traits, the social relationships that people have with one another, the organizational environment that they exist in, and the physical built environment. And this gives us a framework for what we might call today a multi-level analysis, where when we do an analysis of social life, what we in part do is look not just at the individuals, but at the individuals and their relationships and their organizational environment and a broader cultural and sort of structural set of conditions that influence them. So this multi-level model that, that um, uh, Du Bois uh, presents to us in some of his earliest work is really kind of a profound so set of sociological insights. Um, in that work, I'll say that there are things that um, I personally find uh, problematic. There's um, a way in which Du Bois rails against Southern blacks or former the, the descendants of uh, people who lived in slave communities and thinks of them as some source of social, social pathology. Um, uh, but overall, the analysis sort of, it, it, it anticipates the modern practice of sociology. The other major text that um, Du Bois uh, um, uh, wrote, actually, it's not the other. He wrote multiple, multiple major texts. Um, uh, but the one that I want to talk about today is um, Black Reconstruction. And in Black Reconstruction, um, Du Bois fundamentally challenges one of um, the uh, critical insights of Karl Marx. And what Du Bois does in this book is argue that slavery was not just a pre-capitalist mode of economic development, um, that it's actually fully compatible with capitalism. And Du Bois puzzles through why it is that um, Southern whites never aligned with um, uh, uh, blacks in, in this agricultural economy. And he takes a Marxian perspective, but adds race to it in a way that critically transforms our understanding of how it is that social relations work. So the first thing to note here is that for the most part, um, uh, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim were largely silent on the question of colonialism and of race. Um, they didn't ask many questions about this. Um, they didn't really reflect on the deep impact of colonialism. Um, Marx, more than Weber and Durkheim, certainly thought about uh, imperialism and the ways in which um, uh, uh, capitalist economies could do violence to and extract from other areas. But Marx really had no theory of race. And um, this is a huge oversight in early sociology, in part because of the deep ways in which race structures social life, not just in the United States, although strongly in the United States, but in many, many societies. Um, um, so if we were to look to France, um, even though they refuse to gather racial statistics, we would see the huge impact of race on French social life. If we would look to Latin America, um, we would see different conceptualizations of race, but nonetheless a huge structuring effect of race, meaning race would have a significant impact on the overall structure of social life. But early sociologists, um, the European sociologists, did not pay attention to this. And in fact, if we look at Marx's theory, what Marx argues is that in the end, in capitalism, there will only be two groups. There will only be two groups. There will be capitalists and workers. And all workers will effectively be the same. Um, so they'll all be in the similar condition. There'll be a mass of the proletariat in Marx's language. But as we know, among poor people, there's a lot of differentiation. So to be a woman and to be poor is very different than to be a man and to be poor. There are lots of reasons for this. Some of it is because women live longer than men, and a lot of women who are poor are older women um, who uh, live um, by themselves without a lot of resources. Um, we also know that women are much more likely, vastly more likely, to um, be assigned the social task of raising children. And so um, women who are poor are often tied to children in ways that men are less likely to be. 
Similarly, we could see the ways in which race is deeply tied to poverty or deeply tied to a condition of the proletariat. Um, that is to say that it is different to be black and poor in the United States than it is to be white and poor. Now, this isn't just an American story, and we can think about the ways in which, for example, being an immigrant and being poor in any country is different than being native-born and being poor. Some of that is because political systems uh, have all kinds of rules that give resources and um, opportunities to native-born people as compared to immigrants, particularly if those immigrants don't acquire citizenship. And so the idea of Marxists, that there are going to be these two groups, this one group, which is a sort of an undistinguished mass of workers, is to a certain degree naive. And Du Bois looks at what happened in the post-Civil War South and notes that even though there's a tiny ruling class of people who own land and a huge mass of people who are trying to work on that land, that mass of people are not, 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 not the same group. That the African Americans and the white Americans are very different. And importantly, they maintain, particularly the whites, a difference between the two groups. And so Du Bois, in Black Reconstruction, challenges two fundamental arguments of Marx. The first is that under capitalism, slavery is unlikely to exist. And wherein Marx claims that slavery is effectively a form of primitive accumulation. So if you recall from Marx, Marx says, how do we understand in a society how they produce and distribute things? Well, um, um, Du Bois looks at American society and says, this is not true. It is simply not the case that capitalism and slavery were incompatible with one another. In fact, early American capitalism, which was largely, not largely, which was certainly um, exercised in the South, in this agrarian economy, was dependent on slavery. The two are not incompatible. In fact, in the American case, slavery and capitalism are deeply intertwined. This insight that actually we might see forms of slavery within capitalist systems profoundly changes our understanding of Karl Marx. In part, that's because Marx argued that workers freely sell their labor power to a capitalist. So that the ways in which capitalist economies work is that there's a market for labor power and that workers sell their labor power to capitalists. And then exploitation is the ways in which capitalists make workers work more. This, slavery is not a story of exploitation. Slavery is a story of oppression. And by a story of oppression, what I mean is that the workers are not selling their labor power to capitalists on a market. What they are is owned. And insofar as they're owned, the capitalist is not buying their labor power. The capitalist, in fact, owns them from the very beginning. Du Bois, in this analysis, then, doesn't necessarily tell us that, like, the entire theory of Marx is wrong, but instead that Marx missed something crucial about capitalism. Um, that Marx's assumption that workers sort of freely sell their labor power is a naive one. It doesn't fully capture what happens under the conditions of capitalism. And that oppression is fully possible in capitalist systems. In fact, American capitalism may have been dependent upon oppression. This is the first major point of Du Bois, which is to say that we need to rethink Marx. Earlier lectures, I said, you shouldn't think necessarily about theories as right or wrong, but instead useful or not and useful or not for particular things. And by this I mean that like um, theories are like glasses that you put on that make things visible, but they might be like multicolored glasses. So glasses that sometimes you put them on and what you see is the range of blue and that other times you put them on and you see the range of red in the world. And other times you see the range of green. And what they do is they allow certain things to be visible but they also have limits. 
They always have parameters, things that they cannot see. And so your take home here shouldn't be, oh, Marx, Marx is wrong, we should throw the theory out. It's that Marxism doesn't fully have a theoretical conceptualization of race. And Du Bois adds that to Marx in ways that critically transform the theory for it to be able to see things it couldn't see before. The second major contribution of Du Bois was the idea of a psychological wage. So Du Bois says, okay, you know, slavery is compatible with capitalism, but after the Civil War, um, in, from sort of, you know, 1865 to a little bit later, we see a context where there's a large number of workers, black and white workers, who um, do not create an indistinguishable mass of people who collectively fight against the capitalists. In fact, what we see is that one group of workers who really are no better off than the other group of workers, for some reason, align with the capitalists. That is, agree to do the work of the capitalists, of the wealthy landowners, in ways that like doesn't seem to be in their interest. Another way of putting this is that like the white workers would be better off if they joined with the black workers and overthrew this agrarian system where just a tiny group of people, a couple hundred people, owned the vast majority of land. And so Du Bois is interested, why didn't they do it? Why didn't they do this? Part of Du Bois's explanation is that wages are not just money. So there are different ways in which you can pay people. And one of the ways in which whites were paid within this system is what, what uh, Du Bois calls a psychological wage. And the psychological wage that Du Bois um, uh, uh, presents is this idea that like the white workers had this, this value to their own whiteness that in, it, in itself was a reward. It was a kind of wage that they got. Knowing that they were white and that the other workers were black was partially a wage that they received. And they were very interested in preserving that wage. That is, they were very interested in preserving the distinction between them and black workers because it was psychically valuable to them that they were white. And so the system of race, the system of race that sought to value whiteness, not just economically, but symbolically, was incredibly important in the era of Reconstruction. This idea of symbolic values will become really important in subsequent sociology. That is, we'll think about how it is that there are economic values, but there are also social values, by which I mean social ties to other people, and uh, there are cultural values, and there are symbolic values. So an example of a symbolic value would be, you know, I teach at an Ivy League institution, Columbia University, and there is a symbolic value to Columbia independent of my quality which is to say that people look at that and they're like, oh, you know, it's an Ivy League institution. There's some sort of symbolic value to it. And even for students who go to those institutions, there is a symbolic value. What that means is that the education may not be that much better. It may be no better at all. So you learn the same kinds of things. It may not improve your overall wages. And actually, there's a considerable amount of evidence that for most students, going to the Ivy League doesn't actually improve your wages but it could give you symbolic value, that it, it could give you this sense of like you're from a particular kind of school and that in and of itself is valuable. Think about your own educational trajectory for a moment and ask what is the symbolic value of going to school at all or going to a particular kind of school versus another school. In this sense, whites in the South received this psychological wage in Du Bois's terms, where preserving the symbolic boundary between them and others, that is preserving the boundaries of race, was essential to them. It was something that they absolutely wanted to maintain to ensure that they were different than white workers.